Uh, welcome to Trinity Church for a special evening with a very wonderful author, Maggie Knight, and with Dale Atkinson. Um, and we're going to introduce them more thoroughly in a moment. Um, I just wanted to let you know um, a couple of housekeeping matters. We have restrooms uh, up around on the other side of the library, up in this next landing, through a swing door. And there's one also right here through this door. And uh, we have lots of refreshments for you, uh, so please help yourselves. And there's one more bathroom right there through that exit <coughs> by the kitchen. So we're so pleased you're, you came out tonight. Um, I'm the rector here, uh, a lot of people don't know what that means, but I'm an Episcopal priest <laughs> with the job of a rector, which is the head of the church and school. Our school director is here tonight uh, in the back row, Meg Riley, and it's good to have her presence also. Um, tonight we're going to have the opportunity to discuss Maggie's new book, um, and the name of it is Now Everyone Will Know. It's an important aspect of that book that it's about a challenging issue for many people and many families. Our event tonight is really special for me because Maggie and I go way back to 1987 when we met in an attorney's office. Um, she, was with, she was with her then husband, John, and I was with my husband, Robin, who would hope to be here tonight and videotape this event, but thankfully Dave Evans is doing that with his crew. Will Cantor is the Cantor. Will Cantor has the town. So, so he's in the building. Why were we in a lawyer's office? Um, Maggie and John were buying our condo in Hoboken, New Jersey. <laughs> we were moving to the other side of the block. So there we were, two young couples, uh, recently married. And that day, Maggie and I were delighted to discover, because it was pretty obvious actually, we were both very pregnant. And we found out we had the same due date. It was her first child. It was my second child. So thus, we were moving to a little bit bigger place. Um, we both love to read great books, and we decided to we decided to stay in touch because of this common due date, and we became really good friends. We we um, enjoyed each other's company a lot, and we had groups of friends that developed. <coughs> Some months later, when those two little girls were born, Caroline, Andrew, and Alice Hodgkins, our two daughters, a week apart as it happened. But the meeting in that Hoboken Law Office that day sealed our friendship with Maggie and with John, and with me and Robin, really for life. About a year later, wouldn't you know it, Maggie and I became pregnant again <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> but at that point, our lives had dramatically changed. I embarked on a lifelong dream for me, which was the study of ministry, and I commuted from Hoboken to Union Seminary across from Teachers College, which we'll hear about in a bit. Um, and Maggie, on the other hand, embarked on what we might say was really a nightmare. Ooh. Only weeks after their child was born, John became gravely ill, her husband. And as it turned out, he had AIDS. And Maggie scrambled to overcome not just complete shock, but postpartum depression as she struggled to care for these two tiny children, aged two and two weeks. And worse yet, especially at that frightening, frightening virulent time, for the fear of stigma, no one could know what John and Maggie um, knew. You know, they had a family that they could trust and a few close friends. And me and Robin, among them, and eventually Dr. Atkins, and some others here tonight. But as a woman and as a mother confronting AIDS in her marriage, she felt and was essentially alone. So it was a very, very hard time. Fortunately, soon enough, Maggie was also able to find a compassionate, trustworthy new partner to help her raise her children and rebuild her life. And that person is also here tonight, Dave Evans who is sitting at the book table and is happy to sell you books. <laughs> exact change. <laughs> so anyway, this is a perfect moment for me to, can everybody hear okay? Yes. Right? Only stretch for that point. Um, this is a perfect moment maybe to segue into 
talking about Maggie's book, now everyone will know. How many have you, of you have possibly had a chance to read it already? Oh my gosh. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, this amazing book came about 20 years after the unspeakable loss of John and Andrew to AIDS, when Maggie came to realize it was, for a few good reasons, the right time to speak, to finally tell her story in hopes it would free her from the imprisonment of her John's secretive disease, and I ideally help others deal with their own painful secrets in, their, in the process. Or in the words of Maya Angelou, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Regarding this wonderful book, which I loved, I'm going to take the liberty of quoting another old friend from our years in Hoboken, a name you might recognize, Tony Goldwyn, <laughs> um, the actor who's in the show Scandal. Scandal. From him. <laughs> <laughs> About this book, Tony Goldwyn recently said, Familiar as I was with Maggie's story, nothing prepared me for the transcendent power of now everyone will know. Maggie's unflinching, honest memoir of loss and grief and ultimately triumphant self-discovery is a book for anyone afflicted by the plague of AIDS, anyone who has struggled to process grief and make sense of the bewildering randomness of life and death. I don't think I could introduce Maggie or her book any better. I'm delighted she's here to talk about it tonight, about now everyone will know, and the challenging issue of secrets in our lives. So to lead our discussion tonight, I'd now like to introduce Trinity Episcopal Church's other special guest, the aforementioned Dr. Dale Atkins. It's such an honor to have you with us, Dr. Atkins. Thank you for the support and the love and the, the wisdom that you bring to this night. Dr. Dale, as she is widely known, is a licensed psychologist, the author of six books herself on social and relationship <coughs> issues. You may have seen her on the Today Show and CNN, where she's a frequent commentator. Dale is also a contributor to Now Everyone Will Know. She's written its eloquent afterward. Dale? Thank you. So, um, <laughs> I think, first of all, hi to everybody, particularly my old friends who I haven't seen in a long time because I moved from Westport a while ago. Um, I want to say what an honor it is for me to be here with you in this sacred space. And before we met tonight as a group, um, Peggy and Maggie and I talked about the value of when a group is together like this, to just kind of take a breath and to leave everything that might have come in with you that doesn't belong here outside so that we really can just be here together and listen and share and together. So if you don't mind, maybe we can do that before we even begin. So how about we just, what did you call it? A God? <coughs> take a God pause. A God pause. <laughs> I love that. So why don't we take a God pause and just take a breath and breathe in everything that might be helpful in really being attentive tonight and being here in this moment with everybody in this room and opening up our hearts for compassion. This is a conversation that really will draw on our own compassion for ourselves and the compassion for people who are here. And the gratitude that I feel, and I know by the end of the evening, I think everyone will feel to Maggie for writing this incredible book and opening, opening a way for each of us to explore our own relationship with secrets. So what is it about secrets? They bring people together, and they uh, can deeply divide people. And I don't know anyone who doesn't have a secret, or many secrets. And I guess my first question to you would be, why do people keep secrets? Shame. Shame. <clears throat> Absolutely, one of the biggest reasons. And if we explore shame, we might find ourselves going into 
thinking about what other people are thinking about us more than what we're thinking about. And what are some other reasons? Fear. Fear. Fear of? Um, fear of, of facing something that you feel is in your own mind. It's, it's kind of boxed up there. Um, but to admit something to where you take a challenge or you um, you haven't addressed it properly, you're, you're afraid of the criticism, the ridicule attached to it. Yeah, and there's all this, you know, all this fear of rejection and finding yes, I was going to find out. And so this is kind of what we're going to talk about. But we're talking about it from jumping off Maggie's book. So maybe it would be a good time to just kind of pause for a minute and have a Maggie pause so Maggie can tell those of us who haven't read the book a little bit more about it. And those of you who've read it will hear her perspective of what made you write it, when you wrote it, how you wrote it, and what that process was like. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, some of you here have known me for a while and known about what happened to my husband. Not, but not a lot of people, but some people. And I think it's, it's very special to me to be able to sit with so many people I've known over the years and to feel completely comfortable about who I am and what happened in my past. I always had a feeling, and I write about this in the book, for those of you who have read it, you would know this, that I needed to leave parties before they ended or end conversations, because I never wanted that question, you know, is Dave your kid's father, or, you know, they don't look like him, what, you know, who do they look like, and I, I didn't really, I wasn't very quick on my feet, um, I wasn't, I was a terrible liar, I didn't like it, and it, it bothered me for a long time, but I felt I had to do it to protect not just my children, uh, absolutely, but also myself from embarrassment and shame. It's a very, um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but you feel, I felt very alone as a woman whose husband had died of AIDS and had had a, in fact, a bisexual past, if not a gay past. I believe he was bisexual. I think a lot of us <clears throat> who have experienced that have been hiding out for years. And I think more and more people are coming out now as this is a time, mercifully, of coming out. And they're able to kind of step up and say, this is what's happened to me because certainly with AIDS, the victims are the ill, but also there are those of us who have not made ill, which I was, again, thankfully not, um, have to carry the secret and the shame that's connected. That was connected with that very seriously years ago and, and hasn't left. For example, I think if you read the book, you remember I used to write the train to work and I would read the New York Times. I would sort of slink down when I read something about AIDS and think, who's reading, who's seeing me? I was very paranoid. And just the other day, I was reading the New York Times on the way to work, and yesterday, and Charlie Sheen's path to HIV disclosure. I don't know if anybody's seen this article. And I thought, perfect timing. Because it's, what is it, 2016, and he's paying $10 million, and he's got handlers and lawyers keeping him, keeping his secret. And, and I, I think that this acronym, this yet packs, if you will, not no joke of punch. I mean, it's a tough one. So, um, I had an interview with the Westport, uh, Westport Now a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you saw it, and the reporter was, uh, he just couldn't understand why I was so nervous about people, I was very nervous about coming out with this, and he couldn't understand why I'd kept the secret all these years. I think it's a very misunderstood situation to be married, is this kind of marriage. Um, and for those of you who don't know the story, I think Peggy pretty much told it. I was married to a very wonderful guy with whom I was very in love in Hoboken, New Jersey. He was on his a New York rise at the Wall Street Journal on his way, and he became, um, had little things wrong, and I was pregnant with our second child, and he became, like, in a kind of flash, gravely ill, and he died nine months later. Um, just a little bit about AIDS. Then, um, in the 1990s, it killed 150,000 mostly homosexual childless men. And other 250,000 had been diagnosed. I, I, I imagine we all here had friends and relatives who died with AIDS. I remember that. Um, there was a lot of stigma. Um, just to flip over today, just to cover this topic quickly, there are more than 1.2 million people in the United States living with AIDS and HIV, and 12% are unaware of it. I don't know how they know it, but these people aren't aware of it according to this report. And these people are gay, bisexual, and and other men who have sex with men, and black African Americans, and 29% and of the new infections are black, are in black women. So um, it's, the disease has made a shift. Um, there are a lot of people who are yet untreated, undiagnosed. That's not what we're going to talk about tonight, but back in 1990, it was mostly in this country, 
gay men without children. So I was quite isolated. Um, I didn't know where to turn. I did have um, a psychiatrist. I did have really many trusted friends and some family. We all kept the, the secret in the vault. Um, and I, I uh, actually what happened, I read about this, is that in 2009, my daughter graduated from the same college my husband went to. And, and we had not talked about John at all or their father. Um, we had kept him kind of really buried because any reference to him would might prompt that question. And my daughter said, where's my father? I don't, this is Brown University. They have a, through the Van Buckle Gates, they have the classes pass through, um, the alumni classes. And I was just stunned by that question. I thought, I thought, is it time? And then, like sort of like a Hollywood script, you know, um, three years later, my son Dan graduated from a college in California. And there were tears in eyes and said, I thought the whole time about my father. And I said, it's time for me to kind of bring up everything, bring up the stuff and the and the art of the clips from the Wall Street Journal and the Brown Daily Herald. And I put it all on the dining table and they didn't want to really look at it. And I thought, well, what am I going to do now? You know, because I kept trying to kind of group them into my memory. We were like a family. I want to sort of Photoshop the family together. And then I embarked on this, I made a decision. I thought, I've got to, I've got to get in touch with what happened. And so, um, this is about the book. I, I started to investigate AIDS, kind of retrace the steps of what had happened, and that you'll read about that or you've read about that. And I also started to, um, I did some singing. Some of you have heard me sing very <laughs> dirt like songs, <laughs> nothing very peppy. And I, uh, <laughs> Happy Days Here Again was not in my repertory. And, um, and I also um, started writing. And it was almost like I sat down, I had a rental house on Block Island, and I sat down and I started to write this story. And Mary Lou Hanna recently interviewed me, and she famously has a photographic memory, and she, would, she said, how did you remember all this? Did you write it down? And I didn't. And I don't have her memory, but it was just in there. And I, I started to write. And I, at that, so the singing, through the singing, I met a woman named um, McGee Hickey, who's a news reporter who had known John at Brown, and she introduced me to somebody who knew him, and I sort of revived his memory through this, this connection. But I also started writing, um, took up some writing classes, and a lot of the younger women who had published said, this sounds like a book, and we want you to write a book. So I kind of was encouraged, and I put together a book proposal, and I got an agent, and a big agent, and a, a small agent and a big agency, and nobody wanted to buy the book because it was about AIDS. It was about my secret, but it was also about AIDS, and AIDS was a very back burner subject when it came to marketing sales and publishing companies. So, I kind of took to my bed for a while, and then I, um, I self-published this book. And don't try this at home, kids. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. It's very. It's, a, it's really a great thing to do. But it's, it's pretty hard, and um, and I. But I did it, and here we are. And um, I uh, connected with a lot of people. I just want to tell you some people through through talking about this subject. I made a list of these people because I want to just mention them. Um, I left. I, I was. I, I didn't. I wasn't isolated. My isolation ended. And who did I? Who did I reconnect with? I read John's friends. John's friends hadn't talked to me. We hadn't talked about. We danced around John for a long time. We sat at coffee shops and talked about him. And and you know, I read some of his clips. And I sort of got in touch with the memory of my husband, which was important to me. Um, I talked to a lot of gay men about AIDS. Most of us didn't talk about it with each other. They knew. I knew. We didn't talk about it. Um, I. We connected with my support group, my family support group, another church, um, 11th and 6th Avenue, or 5th Avenue, there's a Presbyterian church there, I think. And I, I was in a, um, this is a mouthful, HIV negative wives and partners of HIV positive men. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, people, women contacted me from um, the internet who, some, some of them whose husbands had just recently died of AIDS. Because as much as we know there's treatment out there, life sustaining treatment, some people don't take the meds, and a lot of people are in denial. And finally, I found something called the Straight Spouse Network, which um, it, I've been just, I found the group I should have found 20 years ago, but I was too much ashamed and too much in, trying to be incognito, and I didn't connect with anyone. And so I have connected with this group, and there are a lot of people out there in our flu excitingly fluid, open, um, uncloseted society who are in marriages, um, one, one or the other person of either sex has ended, ended a marriage with some sort of ambivalence, let's say, and um, the result of that can often be um, divorce and, and really painful um, 
sort of complicated divorce affecting the children. Another result can be a blended family or a sort of open accepting, openly accepting family, but this is out there. And people don't like to talk about it, or we don't. So in writing this book, finally, I wanted to be one of those people who just didn't hide the truth about what happened to me. And I wanted to say, this happened to me. I'm one of these women. There are others like me out there, and there are also men out there who are experiencing the situation. And we should, we should, I think, in the clergy, and I imagine you do, and in the psychological sphere, we need to be aware that these people are out there, and they're a little bit afraid. We're a little bit afraid of talking about this. It's, it's a, it's a subject that, you know, Charlie Sheen. You know, if I had 10 million, so here I am. <laughs> okay, that's that's my that's my shit. Yeah. That's my shit. Okay. Um, okay. So we are going to take questions, obviously after, but um, first to kind of bring it now back to the secrets and thank you for you know talking about fear and shame and other kinds of feelings that you talked about. Uh, one of the things that happens, and it's wonderful that. Peggy is hosting this, because often when people have a secret, they want to talk about it, but they don't want to talk about it with people they know. And, and they may not even want to talk about it, they just need to unburden in a place that can be safe. So among the places where people try to unburden are often with their ministers, with their rabbis, with their priests, with their psychologists, with their therapists. Um, and so maybe, what happens when that happens? You know, what, what, what's been your experience when someone will come uh, to you to unburden? Oh, that's a great question. First of all, there has to be some level of trust, I think, with a spiritual leader for that to happen. And a lot has happened in our society where that trust is broken down. So that's something I hold really sacred is of some, when someone wants to share something personal with me as a spiritual leader type, um, I really res respect, I, I really hold sacred, I guess is the best word, the confidentiality piece. Unless someone's going to be harmed, there's a moral obligation, you know, to I don't know, call the police or something. But, um, but that's a great question. Um, usually people will pour out something, but um, and then they, they've unburdened it. And I'm, I'm holding it, but I'm a professional, so I'm trained to hold that. I can, I can do that. But what about the other person who's poured it out? Then they feel they're lighter, and they can go back into the world, and they kind of put it behind them. And maybe they don't take the next step that would be helpful in their healing process. So that's how I would answer that. Yeah, I think that the, that the act of unburdening is really, in and of itself, a very powerful and often very healthy experience. It, it can be the end for the person, and then they can go on. It also can be a beginning. And I think that very often, people will share with a professional or spiritual leader someone with whom they have this confidence, and they're, where there's a respecting of the confidence, and they can then rehearse. They can rehearse what it feels like to not only talk about it, but what they might say to other people with whom they want to share this secret. Or maybe they don't want to share the secret, but they're at a point in their life where they don't feel they can live another moment while holding this secret. You use the word burden, and it's really interesting. There was a recent study that talked about um, the study was done uh, with a group of uh, college students in California who were given a secret. They were watching a video and they had a secret, and they, they had to keep this secret. And the, the comparison was done to how their body responded against people who were carrying a physical burden, and what happened in their body when the people were carrying the physical burden and when they were carrying this secret. Because people often talk about the secret as a burden. I am burdened. I feel heavy. This is heavy on my mind. And our language describes this physical burden. And there were very similar responses physically to physical burden and mental and emotional burden. And when we sometimes give off this burden, we might rehearse it, as I said. It may take months, maybe years, 
to rehearse it in a safe place. And then when you share it, you are able to deal with whatever those consequences are, which hopefully would not be as fear-inducing as they were initially. Perhaps the shame might not be as threatening. The guilt, hopefully, might be a bit reduced, a lot reduced. And you might have the language, the strength, the courage. It takes an enormous amount of courage to do what you did, to live the experience, and then to be able to share the experience and to help so many people, which you're doing. I think the thing that I wonder from the other side of things now that I've read the book is how to be a better um, receiver of secrets. Because I think that was a big problem I had. And I think people I know who have a similar secret to mine, they experience what people say can be insensitive. And we're all, we're, we're all human beings, and we think we know what to say, but we, we don't. We don't sometimes, and so I think it would be good for me at least to have some guidance in that, or some beginning of some guidance in that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in other words, how do you make someone feel comfortable or trust or that like, they can trust you mm -hmm. if they tell you the secret? Because that was I wrestled with that over the years. Yeah. So why don't we throw that out for a minute? So Mary, you were um, in your life story, your friend when you were still living in Hoboken, she did something horrible, yeah. and that is. In my opinion, the status of peace it was the female book, the female book, and the concept of what was that I, I, so, um, can everybody hear? No. 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 Okay. What, 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 Mary, what Mary's talking about is um, a, my best friend in Hoboken, who I thought was my best friend, ended up accusing me anonymously, although I found out who it was, of abusing my children. And, I, and the local authorities came in, and I had to talk about my husband. He was not living with me at the time. AIDS, and I had to sort of reveal that, which I wasn't. Yeah. But and I was exonerated immediately. But then I became really, really afraid of everybody after that. And, mm -hmm. and also, I did. I never talked about that for a long time because you feel very vulnerable when you're accused of that. Um, but I, it was my daughter, actually, who's an extremely private person, and probably my least enthusiastic family member <laughs> about this book. And she, I told her I was wrestling with putting that book. She said, "Mom, you got to put it in." And I thought she was right because by putting it in, it was I was owning it. And it happened. But um, there's a good example of thinking you can trust someone. And so you make mistakes like that. And that's the, the secret. It's a mind, it is a minefield, is it not? I mean, yes. um, to take things down the clergy and your psychologist to take a secret out. Sorry, what were you going to say? But why did she blame you? Um, well, that I never spoke with her again. Um, um, I, was there I, something that you did to her that she was? I think she was afraid of us. I think that she wanted to be to disconnect from us. I think she also might have suffered. Some some people I knew speculated she was an unusual person um, that she might have suffered some abuse herself and was projecting. But um, I was how I was exonerated was everybody sort of came to my defense. I was very lucky. You know, people who were taking care of my kids and uh, I just had uh, unequivocal support. And also the woman who came saw that I was an organized mother and person, but. It was I mean, organized because we were at it. I think, I'm sure she went to homes that didn't look immediately as organized as, because I'm not that organized. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to her house. It's not <laughs> One thing that really strikes me about Maggie's story is that she suffered a major betrayal, which can be devastating. And then she suffered another major betrayal of a friendship, of her best friend. So, you know, the person who was her life partner betrayed her by not sharing his past. And then to have your friend do that, but it just a short time afterwards, I, I just want to think how painful that must have been. I, I just, yeah, what I was going to say is, though, that so when that person, I think you said from Westport now or wherever it was, I couldn't understand how AIDS could have been shrouded in such secrecy, or what the paranoia could have been. Here you are, you, you know, as you just pointed out, she's been betrayed by her husband with his own secret. Mm -hmm. And then, when you're, in a way, you were sort of testing the waters by who you told. That's not a good model. I mean, I mean, so why would you, why would you keep sharing with people after that, um, to I, be betrayed by that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think I would. I, I know that you know, but knew about because I'm in a book group of women who every book we read seemed to be about 
right? <laughs> all gay characters, AIDS, and you know, after all, I was like, I'll, um, you know, <laughs> I'm the resident expert on this. In fact, we all watched Angels in America together, which was, I don't know if you've seen that, I, I think it's quite good. Um, I didn't, I didn't trust anybody, really, Diana, honestly. You know, I was always worried I lost a lot of sleep. Did, did, did somebody know? Like, the reason, I don't know if you know, that the title comes from John saying to me, when I got home from the hospital, now everyone's going to know Andrew has AIDS. And I said, why? I was like a cheerleader. We're not going to tell him. We're not going to do anything. He said, because you're going to tell him. And so right now, he's turning over in his grave, because here we are talking about it. But I was a good soldier for a long time, because pretty much I had to be. And wanted to be and had to be. Had to be because I'd protect everybody, wanted to be because I was something I was against. Shame of. And that's something I think that we should talk about regarding secrets. Because a lot of us have secrets because we are ashamed of something. And I, I think that's very toxic, or an overused word these days, but it is. We don't feel good, we feel heavy from that. We do. Um, and you know, sometimes people keep secrets, it's, a, it's kind of an abuse of power, and sometimes people keep secrets with a very altruistic, protective view about other people. Um, and they think that they're going to be protecting themselves, their family. Um, <clears throat> sometimes in some families, uh, there's a secret that's shared with a child. Don't tell anybody else. This is very common, particularly around sexual abuse, particularly around a family member who, who committed suicide, and then all of a sudden they died of a heart attack and people know the truth, but who doesn't know the truth, and who are you going to tell, and what are they going to think of you? And the story be begins to, to morph, and you don't know who knows what. Um, I was recently talking with someone who, um, who was pregnant with twins, and nobody could figure out where the twins were coming from in the family, and her grandmother decided that just, just before she was going to give birth, when her granddaughter was going to give birth, she told her that she had been a twin. And she said, what do you mean you had been a twin? And she said, yes, I had a twin brother who died in the Holocaust when we were children, mm -hmm. and I never wanted to speak of him again, but that's where the twins are from. Mm -hmm. And um, another person shared with me at the age of 12, in his, in his youth, he would go, his mother and father worked, he would go to the neighbor next door every day after school, and then his parents would come home, and one day she slipped and said, he was talking about his brother and sister, and he said, well, they're not your real brother and sister, your dad was married before, and those are, those are his first wife's parents, a uh, mother. Uh, she died, you, you know what I'm trying to say. Anyway, <laughs> he said, what are you talking about? His mother walked in to get, to get him, and he said, are you my mother? And she said, yes, I'm your mother. Are you brother and sister's mother? No, who told you that? And then she got angry at him, got angry at the, at the neighbor. So secrets have a way of generally coming out, and they often come out in ways that are very confusing and often very hurtful. Um, Maggie decided to face the fact of revealing her secret after both of her children went through a major life transition of graduating and from college and having and missing their dad. Where is their dad? There's a psychologist actually locally, Evan uh, Ingrid Black, who, who says the, la the worst time to tell a secret is during a, a major life transition. Oh. Weddings, <laughs> weddings. <laughs> <laughs> and I will tell you, from my experience, from my experience, the best time, the hardest time, is during that. I, I have a friend who married someone, and the person that she married decided to tell on the eve, on the, on the rehearsal dinner night, that he'd been married before. Oh. Well, that was an interesting time to tell. <laughs> and, and so imagine, when we talk about sharing a secret, think about the time, think about the place, think about the effect, think about the consequences. We hold our secrets for so long because we're afraid of the consequences. So when we tell the secret, how are we going to do it? How do we protect? One of the most important things to we protect, we protect, we protect. But then when we share a secret, how can we do it with kindness? Yeah. Um, my sister died a, a long time ago, but before she died, we went out to lunch and it was very nerve-wracking getting her there. She we get into the restaurant and she said to me, let's tell all the secrets we're walking around with. And I thought, oh my God, well, she'll tell me her secrets, I'll forget them. And mine, she's dying. So 
she, we started the most hilarious, poignant, too. Yes. Every secret you can imagine. I have no idea what she said. I know it's very <laughs> meaningful. Yes. Because <laughs> I didn't remember, and the secrets I told her, she took with her. Yes. But I realized that maybe she needed to unburden the to secret. share. Yeah. Yes. But it, it was, it, we were, we left her. But I realize now, I mean, it was quite serious. It was a it's a beautiful image in my own mind. As you were telling that, I was, I was like, how fortunate for both of you. I mean, the phrase, I'll take this with me to the grave, right? I mean, the, the, the feeling that we have to protect or hold dear and, and, and keep it with us so that no one will ever know. And she had the opportunity to, to tell the person she trusted the most. Right. And then you were able to do the same, knowing that everything was safe. Right. It's it's remarkable to me. The more I the more I think about secrets, the more I learn about secrets, the more we share over I, these years. I think we all with something that I think I, I should talk about quickly because I don't I really want people to other people to talk. But I have a brother who is disabled and when, I, when we were growing up nobody my parents wouldn't um, allow for the fact that he was something wrong with him. And I think it's an incredible time right now for kids who are different, learning differences and there's, there's special learning and guided learning and all this, but um, I knew, and they, they died, and I tried to help them when they were alive, and they were very angry with me because I didn't want anything to be different about him. And when they died 10, 11 years ago, I, he was my, my, I was in charge of him, and I had to help get him. Dave and I, Dave helped me a lot. I had to get him an apartment, and he was living with them until he was 52, so it was really something to him a little alone for a But I had him go through a series of tests, and he is disabled, and so I think that my confronting of this secret and, and, and releasing it helped me a lot to help him face his situation. And he was very brave. He went through these tests. He knew something was wrong, but he and he had suffered bullying, all the bullying. You know, there was nothing. Nobody talked about bullying in the '60s and '70s, and and he has his a life, different life now because he's not trying to be something he's not. He's not getting fired all the time. And I reflect on the fact that sort of you know we just talk about secrets and then the next thing. I think for me, <coughs> look out! Don't tell me you're like don't I'm not tell her anything because it's not gonna you know I'm not like a wanton secret breaker or anything. <laughs> I just had so many of them and I was so uncomfortable with it. And I think that might just be it um, <laughs> for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, secrets sometimes don't need to be told. And I think that that's a very important aspect of, you know, again, what is the point of telling this secret? The only person who can answer that question is <coughs> myself. Why are we keeping it? How has it hurt us? How has it affected us? How has it, how has it gotten in the way of intimacy with people? I mean, I was, again, it's, and I'm sure everyone has a story like this. This woman I know as a child, we never could play in her house. Why? What happened in her, what was going on in her house? Her mother was a significantly, very serious alcoholic and hoarder. And she, this, this girl, my, my good friend, who used to play in my house all the time, I didn't know any of that until we were adults. All I knew was we didn't play in her house. And later, she was able to share that. Later, I mean many years later, and she was so embarrassed. And she, as a child, where she didn't really have the coping strategies that an adult has, and it stifled her. She was so embarrassed, she couldn't talk about it. Every time somebody talked about their house, or their room, or their mother, or their anything, she would redirect the conversation, she would get read. It was clear something was going on, but that was her secret. And it affected her. Our secrets affect us. They affect us physically. They affect us mentally. And they narrow us. And they make us frightened often of what we think is going to happen. And often what we think is going to happen is way worse than it is. And often when we are holding a secret, we are protecting someone else. And that person may not come to terms with the secret in a way that we feel would be healthy for us. So it's, it's complicated. It's, you know, it's a web. It's definitely a web. Let me just break for a second and um, 
ask if you have specific questions or concerns about whether they're your own secrets, people you know, something that you, that you want to ask Maggie, um, in the realm of secrets, because, you know, Maggie had the choice to talk about AIDS tonight or the gener generalization of a secret and what a secret does and how it affects us. Yes? You said when your husband was dying and he said, now everyone will know because you will tell them. I, I wasn't, I read a book yet, so I wasn't sure if I was. he worried if now? Oh, okay. I think that he was, um, I think that he knew, um, he married me, I think, because I had such an, I was, I had such an, I was effusive, you know, I was different from him. We were a good couple, I thought. And he was kind of contained and quiet, and so, he used to call me his original spark of life, but that had to be extinguished when he was sick. And, and I, I was, so I think he was, he just knew, he somehow thought I couldn't, he didn't trust me to keep his secret. And that's where I thought he was really, for the first time in my life, I thought he wasn't very smart. <laughs> because he didn't know the magnitude of what was happening to him. <laughs> it was terrible, it was out there. So I was not gonna be telling anything about what was wrong with him. But it also, that also froze me for the first time it created, you know, because I thought he's more worried, this is what happened, I mean, he's more worried about himself. And I hadn't yet gone for my AIDS test. So it would have been conceivable, you know, conceivable that we were all gonna go with them. So it was the, the real sort of the breaking point in my relationship, and I think that's another aspect of the book is about a lot of things. One of the aspects of the book is that I never had a relationship with my husband after he got sick, and I did try to sort of reclaim it in my final chapters of this book because it was a very wonderful and short marriage. And I didn't want to lose the memory of that and keep it very. But that's what happens. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions for or for Peggy. For Peggy, I know, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that you're talking about with the situation that happened with your husband, one of those words that I have not heard you use is anger. Yeah. Uh, and right. I want to ask about um, did, how you coped with um, forgiveness. That's a really, really important question. And I'll tell you why. I feel that, first of all, forgiveness came with talking about John. Forgiveness came with releasing the secret. Not feeling like I was, I was so bollocked up with it, that it was weighing me down, that I had to hide who he was. Anger was a very big part of me for, for a really long time. And I think, I have to say this, I, I think that I would like to take a course on, in literature, women and anger, because people did not want me to be angry as a woman. And because I couldn't explain, you know, I couldn't, I was angry at my husband dying, which of course not right. I couldn't say why. I think, What's wrong with him dying? You know, I couldn't say, well, he almost killed us or whatever. I kind of felt like saying. But I don't think anger is seemly in, in, in we women sometimes, and we don't know where to put it. I mean, I, I ran a couple of some of you can relate to this. I ran a couple of marathons. I was very athletic. I found ways. I screamed at people. There's that. Dave over there. I was a tough parent. You know, I, I mean, it's sort of a, you know, maybe a little too tough. Um, I, I was an angry woman, and I think I was known to be angry. I looked angry, I think. I, sometimes. May I add something to that? Sure. <laughs> in, the, in the many incarnations of this magnificent book, there were times when we, when we wrote the anger through. And I think that that's important to address. Because some people said to you, this book is too angry. Yeah. And, and I think that that's a whole other story. Why was it too angry? I mean, who's, who's going to judge somebody's anger? And the issue of judgment when we talk about secrets is, you know, how is this, the, the example that Mary gave about your friend? It's judgment. <coughs> so let's just put that aside. But I, I think that as part of working through the feelings that we have about a secret, whether something was done to us, or whether we were engaged in something that was illicit, whatever it was, whatever it was, working through whatever those feelings are is part of getting to the other side. And as Maggie says, it's not news that sometimes we don't have the most appropriate ways, societally acceptable ways, right. to, express, to, to express the anger. Yeah. Well, don't you think women in our generation weren't raised to ever, no one ever taught us that it was okay to be angry. I mean, if you were raised in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 
maybe it changed a little bit after women's liberation was talked about, but it's, it's taking us a long time to to find those ways to appropriately express ourselves. Absolutely, and a lot of the secrets that people were holding, their family secrets, had to do with expressions of anger. So that family secrets that have to do with um, abuse of drugs and alcohol, that abuse of people, these were not discussed. Yet these were ways that we were, that we saw people expressing anger that then we couldn't talk about because number one, it was it was within the family. Don't tell the neighbors. No one should ever know our business. I mean, I grew up in a in a, in a family, a loving, wonderful family. God forbid anybody would know anything that was really going on in the family. I mean, it was amazing. When I, when I personally had my very best friend, Helen, to talk to, I would, I would feel guilty that I was sharing something. It didn't matter what it was, because it wasn't happening within the four walls of my house. So the, the issue of how, how it affects our relationships, as I said before. Um, Can I just yeah. say, I do think that um, we, we have to, you know, we, anger is not always appropriate, but I do think that there are, you have to have certain friends with whom you can speak honestly and express your anger. I also think today that there is a role for social media in expressing anger and not publicly. There are private Facebook pages of, of which I know of special groups and they, some people write and say, I'm not going to rant. Look out, this is a rant, they say. You don't want to read it. But I think that's very um, um, therapeutic for people. And this is not like in the general sort of social media stratosphere. This is just on private pages. But people do need to express anger. We do need to express anger. And, and, and we, find, we should find people who can understand that anger, and a lot of people won't. I just think whether you're a woman or a man, I think people are not going to win. Jen? One way I've found that I can deal with anger from people, people I know, family, whatever, is that I learned that in most situations, where I haven't found contra anything contrary to this, is behind anger is always hurt. Mm -hmm. And when I <coughs> see someone angry, I say, What's hurting them? What's going on? It makes it easier for me to deal with someone's anger. And in your situation, there was so much hurt in that I mean, that the anger was raging out there. So that makes it a little mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But some people who, but in my case, and certainly probably people here, some people kind of thought, they would say, don't be so angry, mm -hmm. or you know, why are you still, are you still angry? Or why don't you just forget this? This isn't, isn't your life anymore. I, people tell you sort of how to be, right? And you're kind of like, I don't know what to do when people say that. So what do we say? I think this is something that I, I, I need to walk, I need to walk out of here learning. Um, how I can help people. I, I, and I don't, does anybody have any suggestions? Like, does it, you know, yeah. Well, I, I think part of the hurt has to do with the fact that, that when the person dies or you're dealing with someone who is just recalcitrant, there's no hope of reconciliation. There's no asking for forgiveness. And eventually, when we're in that situation, we have to write that script ourselves. We have to invent the other person's apology and and beat their chest and say, how could you do this? And then let it go. But it has, but we have to do it because they're not gonna do it. Either yeah. they're dead or they're mean or whatever. Yeah. But we're always angry until we've had that conversation. Um, Are you talking about a conversation with yourself? Well, ultimately it has to be with the self mm -hmm. or getting, getting a counselor or a friend mm -hmm. to role play. Mm -hmm. Where you can say these things, and you, and that person can say the words we need to hear, and then, you know, and then do it. But but it was it was important for a counselor to tell me that in the absence of ever getting that, yeah. that I I still had to have it, so I had to write. And actually, the conversation goes really well when you write it yourself. <laughs> The woman in black. Oh, um, we, Maggie, you asked a question that I think is really important, and it 
more of a 50,000 foot question. Um, how can we be a better receiver of secrets? And I think one thing, you know, one of the blessings of being a woman, I think, I know we're not all women here, but <laughs> one of the blessings of being a woman is that women do have an ability to have a special relationship with other close, close friends. But as you discovered, you can't trust every one of them. And I think each person has a responsibility to look at the secrets they're given. And with the giver of the secret, rank it. In other words, um, I mean, in your case, there could be no higher ranking yeah. given that. And a secret like that requires the level of trust that Peggy mentioned, where there's actually, you have, you have to be able to trust the person <coughs> to give you a vow of perpetual honoring of your secret. It's up to you to release the person from that vow. But we have to, when we receive secrets, know to really, I mean, sometimes, anyway, enough said. Well, I think that, to your point, if I, I think you get, when someone gives tells you a secret, you honor it, first of all. I think that if someone says, please don't share this, you don't. Um, I, and I, so I don't know if that, I think that speaks to something that you're saying. But I, but I also think that um, you have to know what to say um, in response if something's really shocking or like a secret, like my husband had AIDS. If I would tell people my husband had AIDS, even if I were sort of like leaping in, <laughs> people would still sort of jump back, you know. They didn't know what to do with that. I do think that maybe, just a second on AIDS, AIDS is a little bit outside people's normal, um, used to be that you couldn't talk about anything. Now, I think, you know, alcoholism or, it's, people are more open, I think more open about this in their lives, addiction, alcoholism, um, Asperger's, uh, not that they're all in the same category, but, you know, people talk more about yeah, family. Yeah, I think that people have, uh, that many people have lots of things in their families. Yeah. And, um, you know, pick anything. You know, it used to be, well, I didn't know anybody who had X. Well, now I know five people who have X, and I know, and I, and I know and my friends have people who have X. So that which was kind of way off the charts is often mainstream. I think that's one issue. I think the second issue is, and there are two parts that I'm hearing. One is, what do you say when somebody says something to you? What is the compassionate, loving, non-judgmental, caring, decent, kind response? I mean, if you fill that five, that's pretty, pretty close to getting there, right? Um, because if somebody's opening their heart to us, we certainly have to hold it with sensitivity and the caring. We're not going to break it. We, we, have to, we have to be protective of it. So in whatever ways we do, or some people, they're, you know, they have humor, and it works. But if you said the same humorous response to somebody else, they would think, oh, are you out of your mind? So the relationship defines also what the, what the interaction is going to look like, when, how. You know, you don't tell somebody, you know, when they just walked in the door and they're about to make Thanksgiving dinner. You don't do it then. Maybe the setting is important. The timing is important. Little, you dole things out. Many, many years ago in my career, I worked with children who had been sexually abused. And this was all I did. Well, if you, if you thought that you were gonna get the whole story after the, first, after the first opening of what they said, forget it, because that was just the door opening to see if I was gonna be a trusted person. It's the next, and the next, and the next, because secrets are often like layers of, of onions. Peel off, oh, did, are you still standing? Well, let me tell you the next thing or the next part, or the next part. And I may not even tell you the whole thing, because I'm wanting to know, are you, am I safe with you? Will I be safe with you? Also, there's a tolerance level. Some people just can't take a lot of what you're gonna say, because they love you, they wanna protect you, whatever the 
reasons. And it, it may take a while. So that's one issue. The other issue is the other side of the coin, though. Someone gives you a secret. You don't want it. You don't, you don't want it. It's a burden for you. I'm going to tell you I'm having an affair. Oh, really? You want to tell me that? I'm just going out with you and your husband tomorrow night, and we're all friends. What am I going to do with that secret? What do you want me? You're unburdening this. I want to be here for you. But now what do I do with this? So sometime, and now I'm honoring that I can't say anything. So what am I going to do with my secret? Now I've got your secret, and now I've got my secret, and now how is that going to affect my relationship? So again, it's not just how we are receiving it for the person who's telling us, but it's what do we do with the information within ourselves now? How do we process it? What do we do with it? Do we throw it back and say, wait a minute, I, I, don't, know, I don't know what to do with this. I'm not sure I can handle this. You know, what is that relationship? So none of this is easy. None of this is easy, none of it is simple. But it's important. It's important to examine. We have to examine our secrets and what our secrets beget. Our secrets beget other secrets, and they beget other secrets because, first of all, you've got to remember it. Then you remember who you told what to, or who you didn't tell. <laughs> and then the family, did this one know or did that one? What did they know? They knew a different story. They, they looked at it this way. And I mean, how can, then if, you, if you're over 50, you don't remember anything. You told anything to anything. So I think that the, you know, obviously I'm joking, but I'm also, it's so serious. And every family has something that they don't want anybody else to know. And then one person for their own healing, for their own life, to be able to free themselves, need to be able to share that secret. They need to be able to come out of that secret. I think, I mean, optimistically, I think this is a really good time to be different and um, to, to say who you are and what you've experienced. And I am very grateful for that because um, I think we have a much more tolerant society than we used to. I think with that kind of tolerance comes new challenges. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's, it's, it's probably harder now, even though it seems like it's in an easier landscape in which to share something. It might be harder because there's so much more to share. You hardly know where to start in some ways. You know, like you have, like people are openly gay now, there's gay marriage, and so we're, but not everyone's in favor of that, let's say. So you have to, it's still a little bit of a slippery slope <coughs> with, it's, it's almost like we're in a really open society and everyone's sort of coming out on the internet or there's a lot of platforms for people to come out. But there are still people who can't do, some of us still feel uncomfortable. There's a little bit of a threat there. There's, don't no think? Question, there's no question about it. I also think it's intergenerational. I think that there are a lot of kids who find out, adult kids, young kids and adult kids, who find out things about their parents. Yes. And they, those are things they didn't really want to know. And then how do they live with those things that they find out about their parents? Um, and they may find out about one parent, and then not the other. The other doesn't know. So again, there's all this protection. And with children, they often take on the mantle of being the protector, um, loyal to one parent, not the other, protecting the siblings. We see this all the time. This is not new. This isn't, you know, this isn't new at all. But it's, 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 it's a lot more extensive because so many more people know other people's lives through the internet. Yeah. I think that's really important. I mean, I think Maggie's story is a perfect example revealing a secret, you know, has been life-altering and very meaningful and necessary. But I think because of the internet, people are losing sight of, of boundaries and what's, I, I think that there's a subliminal message of it, kind of like oversharing everything and I think there is a flip side. Some things don't need to be shared and shouldn't be shared, unburdened to other people that you know, can't deal with. Yes, and these things need to be re-examined consistently because as we grow, as we age, as our lives change, as we divorce, marry, all of these different things that we do, 
new people come in, new attitudes. It's it's all constantly being changed and reevaluated. Um, I just want to thank Peggy for inviting us all here and for your great counsel and open heart that you obviously share with your community and uh, what you've brought to this community in the last nine to ten months. And I want to thank Maggie for her friendship and for her stellar leadership and bravery. And I'm not saying that in a way that I haven't said that to you in person alone. Um, because I really do think that each of us would like to be able to be brave. And, um, and sometimes we need an inspiration to do something or to think about something or to go somewhere where we might not normally go. And uh, so thank you for bringing us here. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. We're going to have a question. Hello. I just am curious how old those children are now. They're, um, they're 28, almost 28. I, have to, can't, I can't say 28 until one of them is 28. <laughs> <laughs>